I have I actually I met Father Frank Pavone in Texas of all places when I had gone down to Ross Perot's Independence Party convention. I don't know if you remember that, Father. I do not. That was a long time ago. <laughs> I don't even know when it was now. It was so long ago. But uh, Father Frank and I have run across each other over and over again and, and have collaborated on many different things over the years. Uh, and we got some exciting news about something else here this weekend to talk about. But with no further ado, the face of the pro-life movement in the United States, Father Frank Pavone. You know, when we come together for things like this and we see one another's faces, those of us who do know each other. Isn't it marvelous how it brings back all in that moment the other times and occasions, the battles, the opportunities, the celebrations and the struggles that we have all endured together. We encounter each other in a, in a seminar like this. We spend a few days together and we're building on a beautiful momentum, on a beautiful treasury of memories. I know that's how it is for me as I look out at you. Many familiar faces and also new faces. And I wanted to, to ask you that too. How many of you have been now to this national symposium, um, all the previous ones? This is the third, right? So how many have been at one, two, and three? Okay, a few of us. How many of you have, were here last year? And how many are you here for the first time for this symposium? Most of you. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. Well, that's good to know. <clears throat> now, brothers and sisters, I want to start, again, just by thanking you, Brian and his team. And uh, uh, we do collaborate a lot together. We want to increase that uh, as we move closer and faster to victory. Um, the Scheidlers, Sean... All of you leaders here uh, and activists and, and local leaders in your sidewalk counseling efforts, thank you for what you're doing and for being here. Just this morning, I was in um, Rochester, and I want to bring you the greetings of the pro-life uh, leaders and activists there because in many ways it was a gathering very similar to this. There were local uh, activists from many different states, and they are in Rochester this entire week, and this morning we had a funeral service for an aborted baby, and we uh, did it outside. It was on the lawn of a big Presbyterian church. The baby was killed at 14 weeks of development by a um, prostaglandin abortion, and so you could see the black bruises on the body, and that was what killed the child, the, the contractions causing that, that bruising. But it was a moment when, as I said to the people this morning, the reality of what we are fighting comes home to us in a way that few other things can accomplish, that we see the baby. And, and I want to reflect with you tonight, brothers and sisters, on how we can minister to one another, and we want to minister to you here tonight in confirming all of us in the fact that pro-life is not only a cause or a movement, it is ultimately a spirituality. It's an aspect of discipleship. We are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are together across denominational lines affirming a truth, and that truth is Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, if we affirm that as we do, then it also means he alone is Lord of human life. He alone decides who will be and who will not be. And there's the basis of the pro-life movement. So when somebody else comes along and says, no, I will decide who will be and who will not be, that's a denial of Jesus Christ. And so, brothers and sisters, the pro-life movement, the greatest human rights struggle of our time, and I would say of all time, is not simply a response to Roe versus Wade. The pro-life movement is a response to Jesus Christ. Now, because that's true, 
And we, in following him, are his disciples. And that brings with it an entire spirituality, right? A mode of believing and living. It means we assert certain things and we deny other things and we strive for certain virtues. And we have the game plan in the word of God. We know the map to life eternal and to salvation. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Well, then, therefore, if pro-life is a response to Jesus Christ, then everything we do in the pro-life movement, including the marvelous reality of sidewalk counseling that we will delve into in quite a bit of depth these next few days, is something that we do according to the game plan that Jesus Christ has given us, according to what the Word of God tells us. In other words, the Word of God and the fact that we have faith in Jesus doesn't only give us the reason why we do pro-life things. It also gives us the way how. Here's how, not just why we do it. Here's how we do it. There is a constellation of virtues that that define being pro-life. There's a constellation of virtues that define doing sidewalk counseling. Our perseverance and our peace, our unity, our victory depend on being faithful to those virtues struggling for, striving for, with the grace of God, those virtues. You could put it this way. Our success is going to be directly proportional to our holiness, to our union with God. Because, brothers and sisters, and I always go back to this. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard me say this before. When God called Moses... Burning bush was there, you know, he went and see it, and you know how the story goes. Go to Pharaoh and tell him, set my people free. My friends, first of all, what this teaches us is that when you wake up on a particular day, you have absolutely no idea how that day is going to end. And there's a few other things that story teaches us. Because when Moses was told by God, I have chosen you to go to Pharaoh and let my people go free, notice what Moses did not say. Oh, Lord, great choice. (laughs) In fact, I was thinking of applying for the job myself. He didn't say that. He said the opposite. Why in the world are you calling me? Who am I? That profound humility. We'll come back to that in a, in a moment because this is the path to peace, brothers and sisters, for us. We're talking about our own peace of mind and heart and soul, which is going to lead to our strength and our hope and, and our ability to persevere in this work. But notice the humility, the profound humility. Lord, you got the wrong guy. And he didn't know how he was going to do this. Well, how in the world can you know how to do something like that? And so he said, well, Lord, what, you know, you're serious? What do you want? me? How, how am I going to do this? And God gave an answer, which is very characteristic of God, because it shows his absolute fidelity. But at the same time, the answer actually wasn't very helpful. Because <laughs> God looked at Moses and he said, I will be with you. Yeah, thanks a lot. You know, I don't know any more now about how I'm going to do this than I knew before I asked you. I will be with you. And that's what, he, that's, what he, that's what he says to us when he calls us. And he calls us and he equips us. And then, of course, you saw what he did with Moses. And he went to Pharaoh and it was one plague after another after another. So that not only did Pharaoh let the people go, he ended up chasing them away. We, if we don't get rid of these people, we're all going to die. And the moral of the story, when God wants something done, he specializes in choosing those who don't know what they're doing. (laughs) 
So let's, so let's put what we're doing in the context of the gospel. What is the gospel? You look at the beginning and it says, Emmanuel. He will be called Emmanuel, God with us. So there is what here happening? There is a presence, a proximity. I am with you. I want to close the gap. I want to close the abyss. I don't want there to be distance. God with us. I hate that song, God is watching us from a distance. God is closer to us than we are to ourselves. I am with you, he says to us. And then go to the end of the gospel. What do you read? I am with you always until the end of the world. And then you look at all the rest of Scripture. You constantly see the assertion of God as the God who wants to be present. Present, close, union, marriage, the whole marriage imagery, God doesn't just love his people. God marries his people. So this is the context of the gospel. And again, now again, what I'm doing for you here is saying that if pro-life is a spirituality, if it's an aspect of our discipleship, then the more we understand about discipleship, the more we understand about why and how we do what we do in this great movement. And this concept of presence, I am with you, is critical, especially to sidewalk counseling, because look what's happening here. God is telling us, I am with you. And he's with us, among other ways, by and through his spirit. And it's his spirit that unites us and makes us the church, fills us, and then sends us. Sends us. Pentecost is a great sending the apostles, once they were filled with the Spirit, they didn't take out their appointment books and say, okay, Andrew, you take that side of the room. Peter, you go over there. John, you stay here. And we'll just wait for the people to knock at the door and come to us to hear this good news. It was just the opposite. We're not sitting here. We're not standing here. We're not staying here. We're going out. We got something to share. It's urgent. We're going. And so we go, too. People ask us when we're out on the sidewalk, who gave you permission to be here? Right? <laughs> Now, from a purely American perspective, constitutional perspective, you can answer that question by saying, well, let's see, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, you know, George Washington, they all gave us permission to be here. These are the public sidewalks. These are our sidewalks. And we stand there as Americans knowing those rights and fully exercising them without fear. And if we get in trouble, we got people like Tom Brecken in the back of the room that help us. <laughs> and many other and many other great pro-life attorneys and legal groups. Praise the Lord for them. But from a spiritual perspective, we know where, where, where do we get the permission. It's not a matter just of permission. It's a matter of commission. We have a commission. We, ha we are under orders to be there. Don't bother me with questions about who, to, who told you to go come here. We're not there because... We're considering ourselves better than other person than other people. We're not there because we think we're better than the people who are going into that abortion mill. And this is one of the virtues that we strive to grow in in this movement. We are not strangers to evil. We look at that woman going into that abortion facility. We look at that man maybe pulling her in there, or that parent. What are we to think? What are we to feel? We look and we say, I know. I may not have ever been in that exact position in regard to abortion, but on the other hand, I've been in that position. I know, this is what we're saying to ourselves, I know the deceptive, persuasive power of evil temptation, something so evil, making itself look so good. We are, we are, are fooled every day, aren't we? 
And we fall prey to that. And so we abort God's will in our own lives in one way or another every time we sin. So we are not to feel that we're strangers. One of the things we don't ask is, how can she do that? Well, actually, we know. How can any of us do the acts we do that rebel against what we know is right, what we know is good, and what we know is the will of God. Of course we know. We're all in the same boat. You know, of course, those of you who are Catholic and you go out in front of these places and you say the rosary. I was leading a rosary group one day in front of an abortion. I forget where it was, but somebody comes up to me afterwards and says, oh, you people are so self-righteous standing here. And I said, excuse me? I said, we just said the rosary here. And in those prayers, we say, pray for us sinners and forgive us our trespasses. I looked at the person and said, you know, I just stood here on a public sidewalk and said out loud 150 times that I'm a sinner. I didn't hear you say it once. <laughs> what, what, what the world thinks drives us into this movement is self-righteous, arrogant pride and a desire to control. I remember also, you know, another great hero of the movement who was passed on, uh, Senator uh, Jesse Helms. I remember being at a banquet with him years ago, and, and uh, he was accepting an award. And so he got up and he told a story. He said, yeah, he says, you know, I was uh, coming into one of these events one time, and this pro-abortion woman saw me, and she yelled out, why are you trying to control my body? So you can imagine Jesse Helms' response to this. He turns to her and he says, Well, ma'am, in his southern accent, he says, There might be in this great land somebody less interested in controlling your body than I am. But if there is, I don't know who it might be. I mean, we got enough problems controlling our own lives, you know. We're not even in control of them. It, now, this is a ridiculous notion that, that we're going out there somehow trying to, you know, dominate everybody's life and body and choices. No. Why are we... We're, we're driven into this by repentance. What is it that brings us out onto the street, brings us to the killing center? A deep sense of repentance. We are at one, we are in solidarity with the, 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 the people whose sins we're trying to prevent and lives we're trying to save, in solidarity with them, or in solidarity precisely with their weakness, with their confusion, with their pain, with their despair. Freedom of choice? No, they're not there because of freedom of choice. They're there because they feel they have no freedom and no choice. Abortions don't happen because of freedom. They happen because of the coercive power of despair. And what are we all about? We are all about hope. Our very presence out there, whether we're a sidewalk counseling or not, whether we ever say anything or not, our very presence is hope. It is a sign of hope. It is, brings the reality of hope. It lets people know they're not alone. And this brings us back to where we started. It is the constant manifestation of four simple words, I am with you. That's what we, having heard that from God, having seen it in Christ, having been filled with the Spirit who makes it happen, he sends us out into the world to say the same four words, I am with you. And so that to the child who's scheduled to be killed there, we are saying, I am with you. And to the mother and father in such despair and confusion and fear, I am with you. I'm not against you. Even to the abortionist and to the clinic worker, I am with you. And to the woman who's had an abortion and the father who's participated in it and to the abortionist who has repented. By the way, one of the areas of 
strong collaboration that we at Priests for Life have had for many years with Brian and the Pro-Life Action Ministries is precisely the Centurions uh, program, the Centurions movement, originally founded by Dr. Philip Ney, who's still uh, uh, up in Canada. He's a child psychiatrist. There is, I think, nobody in the world who has done more research on abortion than Philip Ney. Back under President Reagan, when C. Everett Koop was asked by the president to gather uh, research about the impact of abortion on women's health, one of the people the Surgeon General turned to was Philip Ney. And he's got an immense amount of research, and he's done pioneering research in what the mindset of the abortionist is and how a person gets into that work. Well, if you understand how they get in, you understand more about how they get out and how to help them come out and how to, what to do with them when they are out. And the centurions under Dr. Ney have, for several decades now, been gathering these men and women together in different parts of the world and, and also within the United States, and that's where Pro-Life Action Ministries came in back under Joan Appleton, and, uh, and ministers to these people saying, I am with you, giving them the, the grace, the healing, the power of the word of God to stabilize them again. And uh, we have, uh, as I say, uh, seen this, this, this movement grow throughout the world, and now we see it have a yet another spurt of growth, uh, thanks to uh, especially Abby's story getting around in her book over recent years, more of these people who have been waiting in the wings have found the nudge that they need to come out. They come out for many different reasons. The biggest problem the abortion industry has is the turnover of, of staff. And so I'm happy to tell you that, as you may have read already, uh, we had a Centurions retreat for some of these uh, former clinic workers back in May, and there will be another one coming up in the middle of September. Uh, so pray uh, for uh, these people. But the, as it comes back to the question of ministering to us, brothers and sisters, we are living a spirituality that has specific virtues that we need to practice. And it's a spirituality that, as I already mentioned, is based on humility, is based on repentance. It's based on solidarity. And this is another key characteristic of how we walk in a discipleship that is, that is, that is immediately translated into pro-life activism. Solidarity with the woman, with the baby. A solidarity that does not recognize a distinction there. You can't love one without loving the other. You can't hurt one without hurting the other. Dr. Wilkie's uh, saying, love them both. This is, this is rooted ultimately in, in virtue and in the word of God. And the solidarity, furthermore, that is physical, and here's where we have to understand. What we are doing in going out there with our bodies, as bodies, because our body is not a tool, it's us. You are your body just as much as you are your soul. So you are going out there physically to do what? To be at the places physically where these babies are being taken to be dismembered. And so there's a logic to it just when you say that. Just when you say, well, I'm going there. Why am I going there? Because the babies are there. I'm going there because they're going to be killed there, so I need to go there physically. And we go there physically because this battle will not be won in the abstract. What does the other side want to do constantly? Well, one thing they don't want to do is talk about abortion. The last thing abortion supporters want to do is talk about abortion. They will talk about constitutional rights, women's health, freedom, even reproductive justice, one of their new favorite terms. But will they talk about what Warren Hearn says about the sensations of dismemberment flow through the forceps like an electric current? 
Will you ever hear those words cross their mind? Will they ever read from Warren Hearn's book? He says the pro-lifers that, that give them the most business on selling that book. Good, it should be that way because we should read every page of it. And we should be, and I tell the, the clergy, you should be preaching not only from the scriptures but from Warren Hearn's book, Abortion Practice. Let the people hear what this is. Let them hear. You know, it's amazing, isn't it? You know people are on the wrong side of history and on the wrong side of a social battle when the thing they're supposed to be supporting, they don't even want to talk about. They don't even want to describe it. The Democratic Convention last year. What a farce. A pro-abortion convention is what it was. One speech after another. But you know what I was trying to listen for? One line describing abortion. Oh, we're here. We're going to make it legal. We will not go back. And given every kind of argument about why it should not only continue but grow, but not one line of description of what it is. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm not just talking to you here about pro-life strategy. If we give a talk about pro-life strategy, what I am saying here is a key and important point. But let me, again, bring it back to in terms of us ministering to each other and realizing the spirituality that's behind it. God became physical. God took on a body. When he made Adam and Eve, he said here he created a human body and a human soul, and he said, Adam, Eve, this is yours. When he created Moses, he made a human body and soul, and he said, Moses, this is yours. When he created you, he made a human body and a human soul, and he said, this is yours. And in the incarnation, he created a human body and a human soul, and he said, this is mine. How awesome this is. One of the members of the human family, one of our brothers in the human family is God. That's the incarnation. The incarnation. This is what makes Christianity different from all kinds of other religions and philosophies, mysticism and practices of all different kinds all through the ages, some of them good, some of them destructive. All of them falling short of the fullness of the truth. Christ is the truth. But he's physical, brothers and sisters. He's physical. You know, some people talk, some theologians, they talk about the resurrection. Oh, well, you know, the spirit of Jesus, you know, endures through the centuries. The memory of Jesus lives on and inspires people. Oh, if the body of Jesus were found in the grave, that wouldn't affect my faith. Well, it would affect mine. <laughs> this is a religion of the body. He is physically alive today. He physically walked out of that tomb. He physically ascended into heaven. And when we are there ourselves, we will embrace Jesus Christ. We're not only going to see him and bow down before the throne, we're going to embrace him. And brothers and sisters, with all due respect to the angels, I don't want to be one. God made me, he made you, human beings, which is body and soul. I want my body back in the next world. Now, for some of us, that doesn't sound like such good news that we're going to get it back. Because <laughs> as the years go on, those pains increase. And the movements are not so easy, but the body, it will, in fact, be part of our eternal life, but without the pain, without the disease, without the weakness, yes, indeed. Human beings, body and soul. How does this have to do with our spirituality of being pro-life? Because, brothers and sisters, I, I want to ask you, I want to ask you tonight... There is a trend within the pro-life movement that we have to be very careful of. Over-spiritualizing. Over-spiritualizing what it is that we're doing, including and especially when we're sidewalk counseling. Because I've heard it said, oh, well, you know, eh, eh, you know, yeah, we try to save as many lives as we, as we can, you know. 
But after all, I mean, the baby dies, and you know, God will receive the child, and what really matters is that we're trying to prevent the woman from committing the sin. Well, hold on one second. I want to save that life. I want to save that, I want to stop that body from being dismembered. That's why I'm going out there. I want to save a human life. We want to stop the sin of abortion? Of course. And will God receive the child? God knows what he does with these children. We trust him. But be careful of an over-spiritualization of this movement to such a point where it almost then doesn't matter whether or not we're saving the physical life of the child. It's the abortionists that think that way. I never forget, and I talk about it all the time, the conversation I had with Martin Haskell years ago when the partial birth abortion debate was, was uh, going on in Congress. And, 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 and I got him on the phone. And we had a good conversation. And I said, so tell me, how do you justify doing this procedure? Well, Father Frank, he said, I, 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 don't, I know it's a child, but I don't know when the child receives a soul. <laughs> so I said to him, well, so what? We're not against abortion because the baby, the baby ha, we believe the child has a soul. We're against it because we believe the child has a body. And you're tearing the body apart. That's what's wrong. If you don't know when the child receives a soul, tell me, how do you know that the newborn has a soul? And if you're not sure that the newborn has a soul, that give you the right to kill the newborn? So the, the, this question, let's not be, I mean, if someone comes along and doesn't believe you have a soul, can they kill you? And, they, and, they, and you, they kill you, and they go into court, and the judge says, well, what, what did you do? Why, why did you break the law? Why did you kill that person? Oh, Your Honor, I didn't know if she had a soul. Or I didn't believe she had a soul. Well, he's going to throw you right into prison. He doesn't care what you believe. It's what you did. And, 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 and this, brothers and sisters, is, look, what I'm saying is this. You want to persevere in this work you want to do it with peace, with joy, with strength. You want to strengthen one another. Understand this. This is the most basic, fundamental work that there is. Basic, fundamental, and immediate. Immediate. In other words, you don't have to find, and you don't have to respond to, all kinds of intricate arguments and philosophical debates about why you're doing what you're doing. You don't have to. Don't let people drag you there. Because the more you get tied up with that, the more tired you're going to get. You get tired just debating with yourself. And anyway, well, you should be using that energy going out saving babies. There's nothing more basic, more fundamental than this. And we hear people say, oh, well, you know, social justice, and we need to... to, to, uh, to uh, uh, serve the poor. Now, a lot of people are going to misuse things that Pope Francis is saying in these very days when he's there in Rio de Janeiro, beautiful World Youth Day event this uh, week, and part of very strong part of his message is serve the poor. And we need, and we, oh, right, we're under command to serve the poor, of course. That's exactly what we do when we sidewalk council. Don't let anybody try to make you think this is some kind of different work, disconnected from social justice. Apart from our commitment to the poor, why aren't you people going to build soup kitchens? Why are you spending time out here in front of the abortion clinic? Why aren't you go doing this and that and the other thing and bring, bring bread to the hungry? Bread to the hungry? Why should we bring bread to the hungry? Oh, because you can't live unless you eat. That's exactly the point. It's based on life, isn't it? And the right to life and the value of life. What you are doing is holding, it's no exaggeration to say, as Thomas Merton said this once, he said a few contemplatives are holding the universe together. Because when we come into union with God, we see not only God more clearly. And of course, we see him dimly now by faith, no matter how strong our faith is. On the other side, we will see him as he is. But we come on not only to understand him better, we come to understand better everything else besides. The value of life and the immediacy. This is an immediate, it, it, it's, it's a kind of a response that doesn't even require an explanation. It's self-evident. Saving a baby is good. That's all you have to ever say to justify what you do. Saving a baby. 
I'm not, is he not the poorest of the poor? Remember, Mother Teresa, when she got her Nobel Prize, and when she spoke at the prayer breakfast in Washington, two different speeches, but if you take the texts of those speeches, they're, they're practically the same speech. She took that Nobel Prize speech and reworked it a little bit to give it in front of the Clintons and the Gores back in 1994. Remember how they were nervously getting their water, you know, glasses of water? They were the only four people in the room, not standing and applauding. When she said, and this, what she was articulating there, friends, is the pro-life spirituality. And she said, if we allow the mother to kill her own child, then how can we tell other people not to kill each other? If the mother murders her child, what is left then for me to murder you or you to murder me? Everything falls apart. When this one thing is permitted, it's permitted. Pope John Paul II, whom the church is going to canonize as a saint, probably before the end of the year, said in, in the Gospel of Life, that beautiful document that Christians of all denominations find nourishment and encouragement in for the pro-life cause. He says there that when the state permits the evil of abortion... It changes its very nature. The state becomes a tyrant state. And the disintegration, notice these words, the disintegration of the state itself has begun. So this is not one issue among, among others. The defense of the right to life is the core and foundation of every issue. And if we're going to nourish ourselves and we're going to strengthen one another, brothers and sisters, in the name of God, Never let anyone convince you that there's any other issue more important. There are all kinds of issues highly important, and we need to be involved in them. And in our day in particular, we have a fight for the defense of marriage, and we have a fight for the defense of religious freedom. But my friends, you cannot be married, you cannot be religious, and you cannot be free if you are not alive. It is life. You are holding the universe together. You are holding the state together. Permit abortion, the state dissolves, it disintegrates. Begin reversing that trend by that physical presence, by that incarnation of the words, I am with you, by the Spirit of God, which brought about the incarnation of Christ, and you are a vehicle of saving the universe. It is, it is Jesus. He's working through you. He's working in you. He's speaking through you. He's loving through you. He's forgiving through you. He's bearing witness through you. And that is why, with all the labor and the toil and the grief, and we need to grieve, we need to minister to one another, and this is a topic for a whole other talk, but what about those lives we don't save? We rejoice in the saves. But how do we grieve the non-saves? How do we grieve the abortions? And just like we have Rachel's Vineyard retreats for the people who, who have participated in abortion, we teach them how to grieve. It's not just a matter of being forgiven. You have to do the hard work of grief. So do we. We have to do the hard work of grieving Every baby we failed to save when we had that 15-second conversation, and she went in there anyway, and she had that abortion. And we need to be able to do, process those feelings that we have, and we need to be, have to acknowledge that loss, and we need to support one another in adjusting to that loss. And that's, as I say, uh, that's a whole workshop right there. But the point I'm making with you simply is this. Brothers and sisters, we do this tremendous, awesome work with a peace and a joy that come from knowing some of these things that I've reviewed with you tonight. A peace and a joy, my friends, that Jesus Christ himself gives us and that no one can take away. No one. It is yours to keep forever. It's a peace and a joy, independent of whether that baby was saved or not, a peace and a joy that comes from knowing that you stood up for justice and that you were the incarnation 
of what God himself says to his people, I am with you. Let us therefore be with one another as a manifestation to each other of the presence of Christ and the love and the care that he gives us. Brothers and sisters, I believe, and I'm sorry that I can't stay for the whole seminar this time. I've got to fly out again tomorrow morning. But I believe that my, um, some of my materials will be here over these days, and I believe also my uh, pro-life reflections for every day, uh, the booklet in which you will see, uh, you'll have a practical tool for reflecting on and living out the virtues of this pro-life spirituality that I've just scratched the surface in, uh, in, uh, in talking to you about here. But use that tool, uh, and, uh, and, and, and we look forward to continuing to minister with you and to you as the years go on. Contact our team. Many of you have had different members of our team, and I bring you their regards tonight and their encouragement. Janet Morana, uh, she's out in California today speaking about her book, Recall Abortion, which I uh, recommend to you. Um, Teresa and Kevin Burke with Rachel's Vineyard. Alvita King. Some of you have had Alvita out to your places, and she's happy to come again. She's over there in Atlanta tonight. And um, Brian Kemper with our youth outreach. You know where he is tonight? He's with the Pope in Rio. Somebody's got to do it, you know. <laughs> we, we send Brian to be with the Pope. Um, but, no, our whole team and our priests and, and, and myself, uh, we look forward to standing with you in the streets, in your own communities, uh, being with you at those victory celebrations, praying with you, grieving with you, and ultimately, hand in hand, heart in heart, with one another and with Christ, reaching that day of victory. God bless you.